Okay, so when we talk about Judaism, um, and uh, we're talking about a religion that has its origins in the ancient land of Israel, and um, this land uh, is, uh, as we saw in the previous slide, uh, nestled um, along the eastern portion um, of the Mediterranean. Um, and uh, this is a map of uh, Judea and um, Israel uh, from the time of uh, Jesus' life. Now, Jesus spent most of his life up here in um, Galilee. Here's Nazareth, his uh, hometown, and um, the Sea of Galilee, where um, he did a lot of uh, preaching and ministry all in this area, and then over into um, the other side as well of the Sea of Galilee. Um, we think probably the first couple of years of his ministry was spent up here, um, and then he made one large trip down to the capital city, Jerusalem, here um, in, in Judea. Now, uh, you'll notice that uh, during most of, much of Jesus' lifetime, Judea is under um, direct Roman control. Um, uh, Archelaus, uh, one of the sons of Herod, um, maintains control until um, 6 uh, CE, um, and then the Romans just take direct control um, over this um, southern portion of Israel, the, the traditional land of uh, Judea. Um, and um, uh, Herod's two other sons, Herod Antipas, known as Herod um, in the Bible, or in the New Testament, um, he is the king over this little section. This is the Herod um, before whom Jesus appears um, um, in, uh, in the Passion story, Herod Antipas. He is the king of Galilee and Perea. Um, and then um, his brother, Philip, also known as Herod, or Herod Philip oftentimes in, um, in the Gospels, he is over, over this section here, um, uh, Batania and Orantis. Um, so, <clears throat> and then up here is Syria, the governor of Syria. So, um, so you can see that this land was under pretty much either direct control by the Romans or under um, two kings, um, two sons of Herod the Great, um, who were more or less Roman um, client kings um, during Jesus' lifetime. Um, how did it come to this? You know, of course, the Jews were very resentful of having Roman control over them. Um, how did it come to this? How, how did Israel get to be dominated by Rome? Well, it's, of course, a long story. Um, um, obviously, you know, if you read the story of, of David and Solomon and, and, and kings of Judea and Israel, um, that is the period, the classical period, of uh, Israel's history, and that lasts until uh, 587 BCE, so roughly 400 years. The Babylonians conquer um, um, the territory of Judah um, and the Davidic kings um, in 586, and that's the exilic period. Um, now, with the destruction of Jerusalem and the um, Davidic kings being taken um, into uh, exile, um, the people had questions because um, in the Bible itself and in um, uh, 2 Samuel 7, David is promised he would have uh, an heir on his throne forever. And what happens then if the Davidic dynasty falls and there is no heir for the throne? Well, people began to expect another coming Mashiach. Mashiach means anointed one or king. And they're hoping for this king to come. Well, um, but he's not there. And, and so second, you know, second Temple Judaism, as, as they come back into the land and they rebuild the temple in 538, um, and they, they're returned from Babylonian exile by the Persians, um, the people still are waiting and expecting, um, you know, once the temple is rebuilt, hoping that perhaps one day, uh, a Davidic king will arise. They have this messianic expectation, and that becomes part of 
um, emerging Judaism, this, this new religion um, that uh, is a religion of the book and um, a religion of the people um, after the period of the exile. Now, the other major event that we talked about briefly last week is the conquest of Judah um, and the conquest of the East um, uh, by Alexander the Great. Um, conquers Judah actually in 332, uh, um, and then of course he dies in 323, and we talked about how he really shaped the whole eastern portion of the Mediterranean with uh, Greek language and philosophy, or the main high point is the translation of the Hebrew scriptures for, for Jews, anyway, Christians, translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek in the second century, and you have the, the Septuagint. So, so he really was the main um, figure who, uh, you know, transforms um, the eastern Mediterranean and introduces a dynamic um, of a tension between Jews and um, culture um, because the Jews want to maintain their culture, maintain their own religion, their own understanding, um, and they're having to do that in a world that is becoming increasingly Hellenized in terms of the philosophy and education and government and so on. And that leads then to tensions, um, particularly with the Seleucids. Now, the Seleucids and the Ptolemies um, are the two great kingdoms uh, that emerge um, after uh, Alexander's death. Let me go back um, to um, this slide here. Seleucus, um, uh, who was one of Alexander's generals, he gets power up here and, and, and sort of establishes his little kingdom um, here in Syria. And Ptolemy establishes his kingdom down here in, in Egypt. Um, and Ptolemy, at the very, very beginning, and, and the Ptolemyans, his dynasty after him, um, and his dynasty lasts well into the Roman period, into the second century after Christ. So it's, he has a very long-lasting dynasty. Anyway, the Ptolemies, they have control over Judea at first, really until around 200. And it's a 199 that the Seleucids um, move south and are able to exert control over Judea. And, and it's at that time that we see a real shift um, in, um, in the experience of the people of Judea. You see, the Ptolemies were very open-minded. Alexandria was probably the most open-minded city on earth in the ancient world. Um, with multiple cultures, a huge library, many religions, all living side by side. And the Ptolemies just were, were just very tolerant. Um, and, and so they, they didn't um, mess with the Jews up in um, Judea, let them worship according to their traditions. But the Seleucans were, were much more staunch in their Hellenism. And, and they regarded the belief of the Jews to be backwards traditions, and they needed to, they felt like they had to, um, you know, uh, and, and <laughs> um, give the, the Jews an education. In other words, they, they felt like they had to enlighten Jews and get them out of um, out of their ancient superstitions and, and bring them um, into, um, a, you know, a clear ending with, with the Hellenistic world. Um, um, who does this is the ruler Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He's a Seleucid um, king, and he he just tries to force the Jews to be Hellenized. Um, he just straight out outlaws the ancient tradition of the Jews, their dietary traditions, their purity traditions. He um, tries to force them to eat pork. Um, he even sets up a shrine. Um, to Zeus in the, Jeru in, in the Jerusalem temple, um, um, even has uh, uh, swine sacrificed at the altar in Jerusalem. Really, was a, you know the things he did were an abomination by the Jews, um, and and his pushing Hellenism upon the Jews, forcing it on them, um, brings tremendous resistance, particularly by the Hasidim here, the pious ones. They they they. They decide 
testify that they're willing to die for the traditions of their elders. Um, and um, Antiochus um, definitely um, grants them that wish. I mean, there are scenes of torturing and killing um, the, the Hasidim and, the, and, and others. Um, a very, very violent uh, man who unleashed a very violent pogrom against the Jews because they would not adapt to uh, Greek ways and Hellenistic ways. So he's, he's trying to force Hellenis, Hellenism, Hellenism upon the Jews, and, and, and it's a very, very violent time. Well, that does not go um, without um, um, a strong reaction. Um, uh, at first, uh, a freedom fighter named Mattathias stands up, and he begins to rebel against um, the excess of Antiochus Epiphanes, and then eventually um, Judas Maccabeus arises with a band of little followers who start a, a, a guerrilla war um, against Antiochus Epiphanes. They know the land, after all. They know where the wadis are and where the, where, where the caves are and where to hide out and where they can ambush the, the Seleucid soldiers. And so um, they're able to win back the temple by 164 and, and, and wrest control of it out of the Seleucid hands um, and, and celebrate its rededication. The celebration of the rededica rededication of, of Jerusalem and the temple um, is to this day worshipped or celebrated by the Jews as Hanukkah um, when they relight the temple um, candles and, and, and start worship back after this terrible abomination of Antiochus Epiphanes. Hanukkah and 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 um, this this event really is a national experience for the Jews. It's, it means that they finally have independence from Antiochus Epiphanes and Judas Maccabeus. He throws off um, this um, um, Seleucid um, uh, rule, and from 142 to 40, um, his dynasty that he establishes, his family was the Hasmonean family. So the dynasty that Judas Maccabeus has established is, is, is um, a, a, a Jewish dynasty, a Jewish kingdom. So finally, after you know, hundreds of years of expectation from, from really the period of the exile until now, the Jews do not have a king. And then finally now the Hasmoneans um, are also kings. They also serve as the high priest in the temple. And um, this, is a, this is a time of wonderful self-rule. Of course, the Romans are their protect, protectors, and it's very interesting to read the books of the first and second Maccabees, where, um, where the story of uh, Judas um, is recounted, because, you know, he, of course, used a guerrilla movement to throw off um, uh, the Seleucid um, rule, but really Antiochus Epiphanes is pushed back by the Romans. The Romans are, are clearly supporting their friends, um, the Ptolemies um, in Egypt. They're beginning to flex their muscles here in uh, the eastern Mediterranean. Um, they're supplying weapons and money and support to um, um, the Hasmoneans. So even though the Hasmoneans are Jews, um, they're they're very closely aligned with the Romans. They're riding the Romans. They're going in on. They're writing treaties with the Romans, and it's the Romans who are trying to uh, dominate this area. That they feel that it's in their interest to allow these Jewish kings to uh, continue um, and to uh, create a buffer between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Um, and to balance out against the Seleucid power to the north, because they're more worried about the Seleucids than they really are about these, you know, these minor Jewish kings. Um, but, but for the Jews, anyway, this was this was a fulfillment. This was what they were looking forward to. This is what they felt like um, had been promised to them in their scriptures, in, in the prophets in particular, that, that Israel might return and they might thrive under um, uh, Jewish self-rule. So you can imagine that it's quite a disappointment that this period only lasts about 100 years. Already in 63 BCE, the Roman general Pompey um, marches on Palestine. Um, you've got two brothers who are fighting for the reign, two of the Hasmoneans who are fighting for the rule. Um, and Pompey 
be sees um, sees them both fighting, they're tearing their kingdom apart, and he just sort of marches in. He's he's fed up with it, um, and basically appoints one brother and, and makes the other brother serve the other brother, and then switches them around. They become more or less a laughing stock, um, and they're client kings to Roman power. Eventually, the Romans get tired of the Hasmonean family altogether. There, by the point you know you get to forty BCE, they're so decrepit and and so not anything like the ideal that the Romans um, had been dealing with that they just they get fed up and they um, they appoint Herod to be um, king. Now, what's interesting about Herod is. Um, he was really not ethnically Jewish. Um, he was from the south. He was, you could say, he was Idumean. Let me let me show you where Idumea is. I'll go up here to the map again. Okay. So um, that's, um, uh, I believe you can see Idumea down here, can't you? Yeah, right here. So he's really from the southern portion of. Judea, um, an Arab, I guess, is what we would call him nowadays. Um, the Jews um, at that time probably would have considered him a Philistine. So he's not a he's not a Jewish um, person, a believer. But he takes on Jewish power and he marries into the Hasmonean um, um, into the Hasmonean um, um, family uh, when when he's appointed as king. Okay, here's here's where we are. So. Um, Herod um, is a tremendous king, uh, tremendously powerful. Um, he, uh, he maintains his power both th through uh, a certain ruthlessness and willingness to kill. Um, he allows really no insurrection. Um, and through these huge building projects, you can see even some of them today, Masada and Herodium, these great, uh, hill fortresses. Um, the temple in Jerusalem, of course, is, is, is gone, but even now if you were to visit Jerusalem and go to the temple wall, you can see the massive construction that Herod completed at that time. Um, so huge, huge um, fortresses that he built. Um, he, uh, uh, Israel did not have a, a, a port. Let me go back to this map back here. Sorry. Um, Israel did not have a, even a port at that time, um, so Herod decides to build one. So he builds um, the port here and just creates a port, carves it out of the land and builds a city where there was no city before. He calls it Caesarea. Well, of course, his friend Caesar is in control, Caesar Augustus, so he names it after him um, in Rome. And in fact, Herod probably spent most of his life or portions of his life, good portions of his life in Rome, at least half of it. Um, so he really was um, a, a Roman client king. His kids were raised up in Rome, educated in Rome. Um, they spent as much of their childhood or more of their childhood in Rome as they did in Judea. Um, Herod, of course, summered in Rome uh, or wintered in there. I don't know, but he spent you know, large portions of the year in Rome and came back and forth. So he was, he was as much Roman as he was Jewish. Um, and he pretended to be Jewish, but he was ruthless in terms of his his killing and his you know he he had multiple wives, um, deposed several of them, had had them killed. Um, he was jealous of, of even of his own children, and there are scenes from the story of Josephus' story is about Herod who uh, you know had his sons killed if he suspected they were plotting against him. There's this one scene where. He has his bodyguards uh, drown two of his young sons while they're swimming in his swimming pool. Um, has his wife, you know, accused of different things and poisoned, and 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 just a ruthless man. And and so um, because he was so jealous of his rule, he didn't want to let go and didn't wouldn't have any of his children trying to supplant his power. Um, there was a, a saying in Rome: it was safer to be Herod's pig than to be his own son, right? Because he pretended to be Jewish, pretended not to eat swine, but he certainly killed his own children. So um, a violent, dangerous man. Now, all of these building projects didn't come cheap, obviously. So um, Herod's taxes 
actually doubled the taxes upon the people in the land. So his taxes really were very difficult for people to pay. And because of that, people lost their family farms. And then there was a large displaced population in Judea during this time, many of whom then came to work on these building projects um, that Herod established, right? So it's kind of a circle. He would build, he would tax, and then because he would tax over tax, people became landless, and he had landless peasants um, who then were employed by Herod in his major building projects. In a way, he was able to enslave a lot of the population because they worked at slave wage, wages to build these things. And I think this caused also tremendous political unrest and, and um, dissension during Herod's rule and um, through um, out the period after his death. Um, uh, and, and, and so there's tremendous tension. Um, he leaves behind three sons, as I mentioned, Herod Archelaus over Judea, who is so controversial that he's deposed in 6 CE, and the Romans just basically decided to rule Judea by themselves. And, of course, Herod Antipas, who I mentioned over Galilee, and, and Herod Philip um, over um, um, uh, the other portions of, of ancient Israel. Um, we also have Herod Agrippa and Herod the first, and Herod Agrippa the second. Herod Agrippa the first. I think Herod Agrippa the second both make appearances in Acts. Um, um, so uh, his family continues, but they're more or less by this point um, uh, Roman client kings. They're no no longer as powerful um, as Herod the Great. They're just really kind of minor rulers. Um, to maintain, help, help maintain Roman, Roman power. Um, of course, uh, during Herod's lifetime, um, Augustus, uh, Caesar Augustus is the great king. Now Caesar, um, the emperor Caesar, he really is the one to unify this entire empire under one control. And he maintains what's called this this Roman um, piece, Pax Romana or Pax Augusta. Augustus is what it's sometimes called. And, and, and he um, maintains it, of course, through Roman hegemony and Roman force and Roman violence. Um, and, and his successor, Tiberius, is no, um, and no less ruthless. So we see a reflection in the New Testament of attitudes towards Rome. Um, Jesus was critical of Roman power um, in, in certain ways. Um, he was, you know, his teaching of the kingdom of God probably was interpreted by the Romans as insurrectionist. Um, uh, uh, and yet we find um, during Jesus' ministry, key roles for Roman centurions and others. So Romans were participating in his, in Jesus' um, uh, movement as well, the Palestinian uh, Jesus movement. Um, Paul uh, himself uh, maintains a Roman citizenship um, and, and uh, claims Roman citizenship when he's in trouble and um, 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 decides that, that when he's almost about to be um, killed um, for different charges in, in Judea that, that he um, that he wants to have a, um, an audience before the emperor, which was his right as a Roman um, citizen. So um, um, then is taken to Rome at the end of his life, where he um, uh, lives in in, uh, in custody, custody, Roman custody. Um, so it, Paul, even in Romans, says to um, recognize the Roman authority, um, although. Paul also, um, in certain ways, was uh, somewhat critical of Roman rule. In the, in the book of Revelation, um, Rome is depicted as a harlot. And, uh, you know, by the time that the authors are writing the text in Revelation, um, there is uh, an imperial cult which they're standing up against, and they, they're encouraging Christians not to engage in worship of the emperor. Well, um, that's clearly a tension between Rome and the people. So, so um, it's a very, very violent time, and um, um, and the New Testament reflects these various 
um, attitudes towards Rome. You see, um, this the Jewish population is seething under the Romans. They're 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 really not satisfied with Roman rule, and and these tensions bubble up finally um, uh, into the full scale war um, in the late sixties and early seventies. Um, uh, really, the Roman uh, the Jewish Jewish War starts in 66, and the high point of the Jewish War, the low point, depending on how you see it, is um, when the Romans finally uh, succeed in destroying Jerusalem and the Temple in 70. Um, Vespasian and Titus are the generals who are sent to put down this um, um, this Jewish revolt, and, and as their reward, when they when they uh, win, they are made um, acclimated to to become emperors in Rome. Um, the chief historian for all of this information, most, most of this information that I've been giving you, by the way, is Flavius Josephus, who is um, the court historian for uh, uh, Vespasian and Titus. And, and he actually was a, a Jew involved in the insurrection. He was a leader of, of some of the military troops that were fighting against um, the, the Romans. Um, but... Um, after the war, he turns to the Romans and, and um, kisses up to them and becomes their court um, author of, of the Jewish people, and, uh, author about the Jewish histories and, and the Jewish war. Um, this arch here um, is the imperial arch of, um, that was, was, was built um, to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem and the conquest of Judea. Um, a victory arch. If you look at it, um, it's in Rome. Um, you can actually see the detail and see how um, the Roman soldiers here are carting off um, um, the, the, the menorah, and I think that's a, a temple scroll, it looks like, or something, um, from the temple. You know, so, so they robbed the temple and they, um, they destroyed it. One, one interesting thing about the destruction of the temple in 70, and that's really the most important date that you have to remember um, almost for the whole class. Um, the, the, the Romans, um, in order to um, maintain the temple that Herod uh, re rebuilt, I didn't mention this in the earlier lecture, um, they had a temple tax that all Jews all across the uh, world had to pay in the Roman Empire. So whether you lived in Rome or in, in Alexandria, you paid a, a temple tax um, to maintain this, this tremendous temple that was um, then, you know, the Romans would collect the tax, they'd give it to Herod, and Herod would invest it in, in building the temple and maintaining it. Well, after the temple is destroyed, the Jews still have to pay the temple tax. I mean, they did, the taxes never die, right? So they still have to pay the temple tax, even though the Romans have destroyed the temple. The Romans take that temple tax um, and they build, um, you know, some kind of uh, a building to um, to Zeus, a temple to Zeus in Rome um, with that money, right? So, so they really love to stick it to the Rome, uh, to the Jews. Um, the other important event um, revolt, it's not really outside of our period, um, is the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132, 135, so early second century. Another revolt against the Romans by a Jewish nationalist. It's, it's interesting because. Um, a Bar Kokhba, um, um, uh, he he uh, he sends he he, he basically um, uh, portrays himself as a messianic figure coming to deliver um, um, the Jewish people and, and starts this revolt. It's not successful.